started. Yesterday you were working on some Hardy Weinberg practice problems at the end of class. Hopefully there will be a little bit of time at the end today as well that you can go back and if there were any of those you had questions about or that you want to work through together. Um, we can hopefully do a few of those at the end. Otherwise, let me know if there are any that you're stuck on. I am going to try and put together an answer key for those, um, hopefully tonight, and post it in classroom um, so that you can kind of double check your work and make sure you're on the right track um, with those Hardy Weinberg problems. Okay, so hopefully we'll come back to that at the end of class. Today we're going to look specifically and a little more closely at the five conditions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium that we talked about yesterday. And remember, we can kind of lift, list these in two different ways. Here, these are the things that have to be true in order for evolution to happen. Thanks. Right back at you. Oh, that's next step. Okay. Um, so these are the five things that can lead to evolution. If there's a large population size, um, wait. Small population size, so these are the things, oh, that, got it. Violating any of these five conditions can result in evolution of a population. I forgot how it was written on here. So, if these things are true, there will be no evolution of a population. So if you have a large population with random mating, no mutation movement or natural selection, then you would expect the allele frequencies to stay pretty much the same from one generation to the next. But if any of these are violated, so if the population size gets small, or if mating is not random, or if there is mutation, which of course happens without anyone's control, so there almost always is some mutation, um, or if there is movement or natural selection, then the allele frequencies will change and evolution will happen. So we're going to talk a little bit more today about all of these except for the mutation one because that one's pretty obvious, right? Mutation happens without our control. And when mutations happen in the gene that you're interested in, that automatically changes the allele frequencies there. And mutation is related to the process of natural selection. Um, it's not the same thing, but you have to have that variation that's provided by mutation in order for natural selection to even be possible. So those two are kind of tied together. So to start with, let's talk about population size and why that matters. So if a population is small, or especially if a population gets dramatically reduced in size, the reason that that tends to cause changes in allele frequencies is because there's a lot more chance at play. There's a lot more just random luck when you only have a few individuals. Um, this is called genetic drift. And you can kind of think that the idea here is the same as um, if you're doing an experiment and you only do something once or twice, you might get results that look like they're tending a certain way, but it could just be random chance. If you're doing an experiment with plants and you just grow one or two plants, maybe one grows taller than the other, but you don't know if it's because of whatever you were testing or if it's just random. But if you do like 200 plants with the treatment and 200 without and all of the ones with the treatment grow taller, you can be a lot more certain that it's because of what you did, right? This is the same kind of idea. There's a lot more randomness when you have a very small population. And that change, that type of allele frequency change is called genetic drift. 
Another example that's in your notes, if you flip a coin a thousand times, you'd expect to get pretty darn close to 500 and 500, right? It's probably not gonna be perfect, but if you do it that many times, it's gonna be pretty close. However, if you only flip it 10 times, do you think you could end up with like eight and two? Yeah, right, because it's a much smaller sample. Maybe not every time, maybe you'd end up with five and five, but there's a much higher likelihood that you're gonna end up with something way off of 50-50 if you only do it 10 times. Does that just kind of logically make sense? You get a lot more randomness in a small group. Small group. So that's what genetic drift is. And it's called drift because drifting is kind of randomly going somewhere without a lot of control, right? This is something that happens. These are changes that happen just due to chance. There are two main types of genetic drift that you often hear about as examples of kind of how this can happen. One of them is called the founder effect. That's when a few individuals, individuals from a population somehow get separated and isolated and they start a new population. So here's an example. On the left here, we've got this field with all different colors of flowers. You can't see the colors in your printout, but they're all different colors. They're blue and red and orange and yellow. This bird picks up just a couple and drops them somewhere else. And so you start this new population of flowers in this other field, but the bird just happened to grab a yellow one and a blue one. So the new population only has the yellow and blue genes within that population. So those are the only colors you see. So the gene pool of that new population is very different just because of the random chance of which seeds happen to get grabbed and dropped somewhere else. So that's the founder effect. This can also happen um, if like there's a population of birds or lizards or what have you on the mainland and somehow maybe a few birds get blown off course and land on an island and start a population there. Um, that small sample might have a very different gene pool than the entire mainland population. Okay, so that's another place that you see this happen. Another example of genetic drift is what's called the bottleneck effect. So a bottleneck is when there's like a large area and then everything has to go through this small area and then it broadens back out, right? So a bottleneck happens when there's a severe drop in population size and only a few are left and the ones that survive the bottleneck do so because of a random chance. Um, I just wanna, there. So this diagram kind of shows an example of what a bottleneck can do to a population. A bottleneck could be something like a hurricane that wipes out most of a species in an area, but a few of them happen to survive just randomly. But the ones that survive may not be genetically representative of the whole population before. So on the left, you've got this very diverse population, all these different colors, but then something happens and only four survive and out of those only two are able to reproduce. And so once they get past the bottleneck, once the population kind of reestablishes itself, there's a very different gene pool. You only have the green and the red that kind of made it through whatever that bottleneck was, whatever caused that, um, that shrinking of the population for those couple generations. A lot of times genetic drift reduces genetic variation because if only a couple individuals get blown off to an island or only a few individuals make it through the bottleneck, some of the genes in the population might just be lost. If they're never passed on to the next generation, you might end up with less variability or no variability at all. A fixed allele, this last one at the bottom, um, means there's only one, like if all of these in this new population were green because just randomly only the green ones survived, that would then be a fixed allele. There's no variation in that particular gene anymore and all of the individuals are the same. Any questions about genetic drift or why a small population can cause change? Okay. The second one we're gonna talk about is movement. Another more scientific name for movement when we're specifically talking about evolutionary change is gene flow because when individuals move in or out of an area, they of course bring all of their genes with them. Um, and so as 
individuals immigrate and move into an area or emigrate and leave a population, um, they can affect the gene pool of the population, both the one they're leaving and the one that they're joining. Gene flow tends to make two populations more similar. So the example here shows you like two populations of butterflies that are separated on either side of the mountains. But if a few butterflies are able to cross the mountains and breed with the other population and join the other population, that's going to over time make those populations more similar. And that should kind of make sense. You know, if you started with like all yellow butterflies on one side and all red butterflies on the other, when butterflies cross the mountains, they're bringing those genes into the new population. The more of them that are able to cross the mountains, the more those genes are going to get mixed and you're going to start just seeing a mixture of red and yellow butterflies on both sides. So the more gene flow there is, the more similar those populations will become. Questions about gene flow? All right, the third mechanism of evolution we're gonna talk about and the one that you know the most about is natural selection. Out of the five, this is the only one that leads to adaptive evolution. Evolution that actually changes the population in a way that makes it better suited to its particular environment. So natural selection is a combination kind of of two things on that list. Like I said, mutation or genetic variation is necessary as like the raw material for natural selection, right? There's got to be variation there first in order for natural selection to happen. Mutation by itself does change the allele frequencies in a population, but natural selection changes it even more because then there's some external environmental force that kind of sorts out which ones are beneficial and which ones are not. Whether that's the ability to reach a certain type of food or to withstand drought or to tolerate cold temperatures or to escape from predators or whatever it may be. Those things tend to change the allele frequency in a particular way to make those organisms better suited for the environment over time. The outcomes of this are not random. The first couple, genetic drift is totally random, chance events that affect allele frequency. Movement of individuals is also fairly random. It's not necessarily improving the population for that environment or anything. It's just mixing in new genes. Mutations are random, but natural selection is not. The variation is random, but the end result is very specific based on that environment. And so this consistently increases the frequency of alleles that help not only with survival, it's important to remember um, that in terms of evolution, fitness, the fittest individuals are not only the ones that survive, but the ones that reproduce the most. In other words, they contribute more of their good surviving genes to the next generation than others do. So fitness is not just surviving, it's passing on your genes the most. So having the most offspring that then go on to survive and reproduce again and continue passing on those genes. Any questions just about basic natural selection? So we're going to continue talking about natural selection um, and look at a few specific types of natural selection that happen. And the first one also has to do with that idea of non-random mating. I moved these two slides, so we're just jumping a few forward and then we'll come right back. One type of natural selection um, that is also one of the reasons that mating might not be random in a population is if individuals in the population with certain traits are more likely to obtain mates than other individuals. There's all kinds of examples of this anywhere that you can think of an animal that has any kind of mating display, um, either like big showy feathers or um, specific coloration or really big antlers 
or specific behaviors. Some types of animals will do like, you know, specific mating dances to attract mates or they have a specific call um, or will like build nests or homes or whatever to attract mates. Any of that stuff um, could be an example of sexual selection. If individuals are getting the opportunity to mate more because of certain traits that they have, those traits are going to get passed on to the next generation more and more. This tends to lead to something called sexual dimorphism. Di means two, and morph means like differences in shape or appearance. Um, and so this is, if you can think of any species where the male and female look obviously different, that's sexual dimorphism. When the males and females look very different, it could be a difference in size. In some species, one, either the male or female is significantly larger or smaller than the other. It could be color. You see that a lot in birds where the females are really kind of drab colored, but the males are really bright. That's an example of sexual dimorphism. It could be ornamentation, um, like the tail feathers of a peacock or antlers on male deer. Um, do female deer have antlers too? They do, don't they? They can, but they don't usually. That's right. I'm thinking of something else. Um, so that's another example of this or differences in behavior. So sexual dimorphism can happen from any of those, but it's usually the result of sexual selection. And this can kind of be a little further broken down. There are kind of two different types. Intra means within those of the same sex. This is usually competition for mates. So any, and you can see there are a few examples in the pictures here, most often, this is males of the species who actually physically compete, fight to see who gets to mate with the females. Um, it's not always males, but generally it is the males of the species that do this. So intrasexual selection is when it's within competition within those of the same sex. There's also intersexual selection, um, which is also referred to as mate choice. So this is more um, when things like female birds look for a mate who has the brightest colors, or female lions look for a mate that has the biggest, shaggiest mane, or they look for um, a mate that has built the best nest area or whatever, any of those things. And again, in general, it's usually the females that are choosy in who they breed with. Not always, there are exceptions to both of these. Um, but those are kind of the two main types of sexual selection that can happen. And if any of this type of selection is happening, then mating is not random within that population. And evolution is going to happen that favors these traits um, that make the males and females more and more different from each other to give them an advantage in that competition for mates. Since the goal of this whole thing is to continue passing on their genes. Any questions about this? All right, now we'll jump back to those slides that we skipped over. There are kind of three main ways that natural selection can change a population when you're looking at a certain trait. And hopefully these are things that you have seen before because I know this is something that you've learned about before. The first one is called directional selection. And the names of these really do kind of explain what's happening and how they work. Directional selection is when that characteristic for the whole population shifts in the same direction. So overall, the entire population gets taller or gets lighter colored or whatever, but they're all changing in the same way. The example that you have here is looking at these tails of lizards. And if they have long, wiggly tails, their tail looks like a snake and it scares away predators. So the longer the tail, the more it looks like a snake. And so over time, you'd expect the tails of these lizards to get progressively larger and larger. We represent these types of selection graphically using a bell-shaped curve. So the dotted line is the original population. Most traits, if you actually like graph them out, will form this basic bell-shaped distribution, um, which should kind of make sense if you think about something like 
height, which is one that we're pretty familiar with. If you think about human height, the middle is average, right? And most adult humans are fairly close to average, right? So you have a lot of people right at the top here, right at average. You have a lot of people close to average here and here, but the further from average you get, the fewer people there are. There are a few people who are extremely tall and a few people who are extremely short, but you get basically this bell distribution. Does that shape of that graph make sense to you? And that's true for most traits in most populations. In this case, our original population of lizards, most of them had average length tails. There were a few with extremely short tails and a few with extremely long tails. And in the case of directional selection, one extreme trait is better than the other extreme. So in this case, the ones with really short tails all died off. The ones with extremely long tails were the ones that survived best and passed on that disease or that gene. And so over time, the entire graph, the entire population shifts to the right and the average tail length of the whole group gets longer. This is often what we see with sexual selection. You see if it's selection for bright coloring in the male birds. The males over time tend to get brighter and brighter and brighter, okay? Um, so that would be an example of directional selection. Any questions about that one? Stabilizing selection selects for the intermediate values. In this case, basically, average is best. It's not good to be on either extreme. So here's kind of an example of how that might work. Cat tails come in a range of lengths. So again, the dotted line is our original population. You have most of them around average, but some have really short tails and some have really long tails. But it turns out cats with really, really short tails don't have good balance because their tail isn't long enough to help them keep their balance. So they don't survive very well. And cats with really long tails drag on the ground, which hinders the cat's movements and hunting. So they don't survive as well. So over time, your graph becomes, this population for this trait becomes less diverse and you get more that are average. And so this actually decreases variability in a population and makes them all more similar and closer to average, closer to the center. Any questions on that one? And the third one, disruptive selection, is basically the opposite of that. In this case, being average is worse and the extremes are better. So here, we have another example of tail length, but in a different organism, and so the results are different. Um, the tails start with kind of that normal distribution, lots in the middle, and some real short and some real long. Well, it turns out if you have a really short tail, that's good, because then predators can't grab onto your tail and catch you when you're on the ground, and so a lot of these survive. Long tails are also good because they help you balance in the trees. So these guys survive really well and don't fall out of trees. But if you only have a medium length tail, predators can still catch you when you're on the ground and you can't keep your balance very well when you're in the trees. So you don't really do that great in either environment. So you can see that tree doesn't totally disappear, but there's less of the average trait because they don't tend to survive as long which means they don't reproduce as much, so those genes don't get passed on as much. So disruptive selection tends to kind of disrupt the pattern and separate that trait and favor the extremes. Do you have any questions about these three different types of selection? Okay. There are all
also some other really interesting examples of how natural selection can work. And we're just going to talk about one of these. Um, this is an example of something called balancing selection. And it can also be referred to as the heterozygote advantage. Sometimes natural selection actually kind of favors having two different alleles. So there's not necessarily one of them that's good and one of them that's bad. Sickle cell anemia is a really interesting example of a trait that's got um, some interesting selective pressures in a few different ways that shows you just a little bit more the complexity of how this can work. We're going to watch um, a video, it's about 12 or 13 minutes, that talks a little bit about sickle cell anemia, the genes that cause it, but also why that gene doesn't completely disappear. Because sickle cell anemia is a very serious disease, especially in developing countries where they can't treat it as well. Um, and normally with diseases that cause really severe effects, you would expect those genes to slowly kind of get weeded out of the population because those people tend not to survive as long or reproduce as often because they don't survive as long. And so you'd expect those genes to kind of slowly become much less frequent but in this case, they don't. This gene just sticks around because of this balancing selection that actually makes it advantageous to have one copy of the gene and bad to have two. So we're going to watch this video, and then I just have like one more slide that we're going to talk about to kind of wrap up thinking about natural selection for today. Kylie and Ashley, I will put the link to this video in the chat. So if... Um, if you want to just click on it, I'm going to let you click on it and watch this video yourself so it's not glitchy through the meat. But as soon as I put it in there, go and watch this video and then stay on the meat because, like I said, there's a little bit of wrap up at the end. Okay? Give me just one second to go throw that in the chat and pull up the video and then we will start that part. Kylie and Ashley, are you back and ready? Yeah. Ashley, how about you? Yeah. Okay, good. So that was just kind of a really unique example of why some traits don't completely disappear, even if they seem to be harmful. In other situations, they can provide a benefit. So natural selection doesn't always happen in one clear and consistent direction because the environment is full of a multitude of factors. That video also talked a lot about a really, really important thing to remember about natural selection and evolution. Natural selection is not a process that is trying to make the ultimate best perfect organism. Um, and it can't do that for a multitude of reasons. First of all, natural selection can only happen with the variation that's already there. You can't look around and say, hey, it'd be really great to have this mutation in this gene. Let's do that now. Mutations are random, right? And so out of the mutations and the variation that's available, natural selection picks the ones that are a little better than others, but they may not be perfect. Evolution is also limited by history. Species have been evolving for a long, long time, and evolution can't just totally ditch something and start from scratch. For example, if we decided that we wanted to be able to fly, it would be really cool if we could just suddenly have a pair of wings spread out of our shoulders, right? But that's probably not going to happen. If human beings ever someday evolve to be able to fly, it's much more likely that our arms would go through a series of changes that would eventually turn them into wings, right? Because that's what evolution has to work with. You can't just scrap everything that's old and build something completely new. Natural selection has to work with what's already there, which has been shaped by the process of natural selection for millions of years. Adaptations are often compromises. Like you saw with that example with sickle cell, there are a few competing things that are kind of working almost in opposite directions on that particular gene. 
a lot of species, like um, one example that it discusses in your book is like seals spend quite a bit of time out of the water. It might be really helpful to them to have legs so they could walk on land, but then they wouldn't be able to swim as well. And so it's kind of a compromise. The things that allow organisms to survive and reproduce the most are often compromises. We see that with sexual selection a lot too. That ginormous, bright, shiny tail feather display of a peacock might be really good for attracting mates. Probably not so great when that bird's trying to hide from predators, right? And so there's always these kind of competing demands. And so evolution includes a lot of compromises. And there's a lot of other factors that interact with this. There is also chance that process of genetic drift also affects how evolution is going to happen. And the environment might change. What was a beneficial adaptation a few generations ago, if the environment changes, now might not be the best solution anymore. And so it's a continual process of gradual change, just kind of picking out the best of what's available at that time for that environment. But there are lots of factors that go in that make this really complicated. Do you have any questions about anything from today? Okay, I'm just gonna pause my recording now that I'm done with the lecture part. I know that was a lot of notes. It's been a while since we had a lot of notes day, but we had to just kind of talk through a bunch of that stuff to 